Amen? Okay. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 9, and uh, we'll be starting out there. Like I said, I'm going to be bouncing around quite a bit. And uh, I'm just kind of sharing with you that God has a plan. God has a plan. Amen? Hallelujah. Luke chapter 9. God has a plan. Amen? God has a purpose. God has a design. And uh, Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to start out. And like I said, I'm going to bounce you around a little bit tonight from Luke chapter 9 and probably Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 9 a little bit. And they're all the, the same, basically the same account uh, of Jesus commissioning the 12 uh, apostles and then Jesus commissions the 70 and then Jesus commissions the church if we're going to look at that. We're going to see that God had a plan for each and every one and it never changed. God's plans and God's purposes for taking the gospel to a lost and dying world has never changed. And uh, Luke chapter 9, if you, if you want to read along with me, verse number 1, says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. You notice that he gave them power and authority. Power and authority. And what we're going to look at tonight a little bit is that combination, power and authority. God has equipped the body of Christ to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. He has given us power and he has given us authority. He has given the, he gave the 12 power, he gave the 12 authority. He later on here in a moment commissioned 70 people and he gave them power and he gave them authority. And then a little bit later, after the death, burial, and resurrection, he commissioned the church, and he gave them power, and he gave them authority. God's plan, and God's purpose, and God's design for taking the gospel to a lost and dying world is that we do it with power and with authority. And I want to just kind of look at this a little bit tonight, and so we cut, hopefully come from here with a little bit of an idea of what he's talking about. Now, if we go back to Matthew chapter 9, like I said, I'm going to bounce you around quite a bit, and these are between two particular recordings, records of the same events. Uh, but each one kind of gives us a little bit different light, a little bit more extra maybe than the other ones in some cases on particular instances. I'm going to go back to Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 9, I'm going to show you something here. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So we see there that Jesus went forth, and Jesus did he preached the gospel, he healed the sick, he, he cast out demons, he did that work. A little bit later, he, he goes in, he tells the twelve, he gives them power and authority to cast out devils, to heal the sick. Later on, he tells the 70, he gives them power and authority, cast out devils, heal the sick. A little bit later, he commissions the church, he gives them power and authority to cast out devils and to heal the sick. But I want you to notice something here that we're going to walk through this just a moment. But verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they faded and were scattered and brought as sheep having no shepherd. Verse 37 is what I want to draw your attention to. Then he saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So it tells us there that Jesus goes from healing the sick, casting out devils, preaching the gospel, looking out at the multitudes, and when he looks out at the multitudes, then he, he says, Wait a second. The harvest is plenteous. Look at that out there. Look at the multitudes out there. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And I used to read that years ago, and I used to really kind of struggle with that. Why are the laborers so few? I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. Why are there so few laborers? I mean, you could go around and you could go to a lot of churches and, 
and say, how many of you are willing to serve God? And a lot of people put their hands up. A lot of people say, I am, I am, I am. So why would the laborers be so few? But you'll notice that I think there's a real connection because after he goes on here, after he tells us the laborers are few, verse 28, 38, excuse me, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into this harvest. Then notice what he does in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So we see Jesus is preaching the gospel, he's healing the sick, he's casting out demons, he goes from that to looking out at the multitudes, and he says, boy, look at that harvest that's out there. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And then he goes from that to he immediately commissions the twelve, gives them power and authority to go forth and do what he is doing, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, and casting out devils. So maybe if we look at something now, maybe the labors being few is not because of willingness. You see, I mean, imagine I had like, you know, 20 cars out here, or 20 trucks, and they're all loaded up, and they're ready to go. And I says, you know what, I'm going to take these 20 trucks, and we're moving all of this stuff, and we're moving it all over to Indiana, and we're doing this for some other church. And I says, now, how many people here are willing to drive? And, you know, like, you know, Zach raised his hand, and Caleb raised his hands, and, you know, all the kids raised their hands. They're willing to drive. They're willing to drive those trucks to Indiana. Willingness is not a problem. There's a problem, though, because they don't know how to drive. <laughs> so I don't know that I want to put them behind the wheels of this big truck. See, the problem is not willing to say, well, you know, drivers are few. Supposing we had two keyboards up here. I'd say, how many of you are willing to get up and play all the keyboards tonight? Probably a lot of people would raise their hands. I'm willing. How many of you know how to play the keyboard? Other than Nathan, we're in trouble. <laughs> if the problem is not willingness, the problem is ability to do it. The problem is not having the equipment or the tools necessarily to do it. So he said, the laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. Why are the laborers few? Because to go into the harvest field and to bring in the harvest, you have to have the power and the authority to do it. So he said, now I'm looking out at the multitudes. I'm looking out at the harvest. We need some laborers. He calls the twelve. I'm giving unto you power. I'm giving unto you authority. And now I'm sending you into the harvest field. You see, you might be able to say to David, they might, God might be able to look down and say, you know what, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few, because maybe they're still walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe they're still walking in the authority that they have in Christ. So then the laborers would be few. Not because people aren't willing. Because people haven't been in power. Not because people aren't willing, but maybe because people don't have the revelation of the authority they have in Christ Jesus. So we'd have to ask ourselves, are the laborers few today? Are people walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are people walking in a revelation of the authority that they have in Christ Jesus? You see, we've got to understand the purpose here. Go back to Luke chapter 9 again. I told you I'm going to bounce you back and forth between these scriptures. Look at Luke chapter 9. Hallelujah. He had told him, he gave them power and authority. And he told him to do something. Verse number 2. After he gave them power and authority over the devils and to cure diseases. Verse 2 he says, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. And to heal the sick. We drop down to verse number 6. And they departed and went to the town, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere they went. So we understand that then we go into Luke chapter 10 when he commissioned the 70 and he did the same thing with them. And they went out and healed the sick and proclaimed the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us that, 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 that that's after they, they came back from that and, and that's when they said, you know, Jesus, they were marveled and amazed that even the devils are subject to us in your name. And that 
times when Jesus taught us, well, don't rejoice in that. I see, yeah. you know, Satan fall from the heavens like lightning. But rejoice because your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. So for the point I'm making, if they come back and they're rejoicing because the damn devils are subject to them, in his name apparently they're casting out demons too. They're healing the sick and preaching the gospel. Luke chapter 9, when he sent the 12 out, they went out, they preached the gospel, they healed the sick, and they cast out devils. Mark chapter 16, when he commissioned the church, he tells them to preach the gospel, he tells them to cast out devils, he tells them to lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Have you noticed the pattern? Jesus preached the gospel, Jesus healed the sick, and cast out devils. The twelve were commissioned to preach the gospel to heal the sick and cast out devils. The seventy were commissioned to preach the gospel, heal the sick and cast out devils. The early church was commissioned to preach the gospel, heal the sick and cast out devils. The book of Acts, the church went forth, they preached the gospel, they laid hands on the sick and they cast out devils. Do you see a pattern? There's a thing in the military. Your last orders are your standing orders. So if you're in the military, they tell you to set up camp right here. You set up camp right there. When do you move? When you get your next orders. Other than that, you stay there. Your last order is your standing order. The last thing you were told to do is what you're supposed to do until you're told otherwise. They don't say, well, you know, it, it just seemed like, you know, you speak to the, the commanding officer and say, you know, it just seemed like we've been here for a long time and we just felt like a change, so we moved on. No, you stay there. And I think you should apply the same thing to what Christ is doing here. I think you can say in the kingdom of God that your last orders are your standing orders. That the last orders that he gave to the church was to preach the gospel, they hands on the sick and cast out devils. Last order would be our standing orders. You see, the thing we've got to understand here, God has given us the tools we need to share the gospel. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the Word of God. He's given us the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We have the power we have the word and we have the authority to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. One of the things that hinders people all the time is people look at themselves. Well, pastor, I share the gospel with so-and-so, but I know they won't listen to me. Well, they might listen to the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I know I can't do it. I mean, what are you talking about casting out devils? I'm talking about doing it in the name of Jesus, not in the name of me. You see, we don't look at who we are. We look at what God has provided us to do what he's told us to do. He has commissioned each and every one of us as the body of Christ to free proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. And he said he has given us power to be witnesses. And he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us the authority of the name of Jesus. And we love it. We have a commission to go forth in that power and in that authority and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. But we can't look at what we are or what we've got in the sense of the natural. Well, I did not that intelligent. Well, you're going in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the name of intelligence. <laughs> well, what if somebody asks a question? I don't know. I tell you, tell the truth. Tell me you don't know. Trust the Holy Spirit to change your heart. You see, beloved, we've got to understand there. It hasn't changed. God's way of doing things has never changed. He gives us power and he gives us authority. Now, the classic example, the illustration I've always heard to demonstrate the difference between power and authority would be a police officer and a big semi-truck. Now, you're out here in the middle of the road. Great big giant semi trucks come flying down the highway doing about 75 miles an hour. A little bitty police officer weighs 120 pounds, steps out in front of that truck and goes like this. What's going to happen? Chances are pretty good that truck's going to stop. As long as that police officer's giving him plenty of time to do that. And as he steps out in front of that truck, 
He holds up his hands, the police officer standing there, and that truck stopped. Why does that truck stop? He's got a lot more power than that police officer does. He can run right on top of him, too. And not even slow him down, not even though he hit anything. Because the police officer has authority. The semi-truck has power. The police officer has authority, but behind that authority is power. Because behind that authority is all the other police officers. And if need be, behind that authority is the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force, and the nuclear weapons of the United States. All of our powers stand behind that authority, but because of that authority, the power stops. But it says there that God gave power and authority. He gave you and I the power of the Holy Spirit, and he gave us the authority of the name of Jesus to go into the world and preach the gospel. Amen? Are you with me so far? Hallelujah! Praise God! Glory to God, Jesus is alive! Amen? You have to rejoice in that. I've got power and I've got authority in the name of Jesus. I have a commission from God to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel in His power and in His authority. Hallelujah! That ought to be enough to wake anybody up. Hallelujah! Praise God! With me so far. Now let me try to make to Luke chapter 9. We're just going to kind of bounce around this and look at some things. So I want us to understand God does have a plan. God has a plan to take the gospel to the world. But we need to realize it's not our resources. It's not Mike's power. It's not Mike's authority. It's not Mike's money. Well, who's going to finance all this stuff? Who's going to pay for this? I mean, is Caterpillar going to pay for it? How about the president? Is President Trump going to take it out of his account? Who's going to pay for this? I mean, you got to think about this. Apparently, God has a system of doing this. I mean, when God set up there, God before the foundation of the world says, you know what? Mankind, I'm going to create man. Man's going to fall. Man's going to need a savior. Man's going to need a redeemer. We're going to have to do something about that. I'm going to send my son Jesus Christ to die and pay the price. He's going to be buried, resurrected, ascended on the right hand. I'm going to give him all power, all authority. He's going to commission the church to go to all the world and preach the gospel. God had to have a plan. To pay for that. Amen? Amen. Do you know how much it costs to, to, to take the gospel to all the world? Have you ever thought about that? Yes. Well, that's just been kind of funny. <laughs> for example, do you remember the Good Samaritan parable? Good Samaritan parable is a uh, the man is, 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 is robbed and wounded and left beside the road again. And we know the, the Levite comes and he just looks at him laying there and walks on by. The Pharisee, he just comes on by and looks at him and just keeps on going. The Good Samaritan comes along and the Good Samaritan goes over there, ministers to him, bandages him up, helps fix up his wounds, takes him to an inn and says, I'm going to pay for his stay and if you need any more money, let me know. Now how do you know that maybe the reason the Pharisee and the Levite walk by is maybe they couldn't afford to do anything. It took money to take care of the Good Samaritan. It took money to be the Good Samaritan. Didn't it? Everybody talk about money until I get nervous. <laughs> Think about it. It took money to be the Good Samaritan. Doesn't the Bible tell us to feed the poor? Let me ask you, does it cost money to feed the poor? Doesn't the Bible tell us, everybody likes to use those scriptures, doesn't the Bible tell us to clothe the people who need clothing? Does it take money to do that? You know what it tells us to house all of us? Does it take money to do that? It tells us to send preachers in all the world preach the gospel. See, people always say, well, money, like it's a bad thing, but you know it takes money to obey God. Because you can't do those things that we're told to do unless there's some money involved. 
说。
So we're going to see that as we plant seeds, then, you know, a farmer determines the harvest, how many seeds he planted is determined by how big the harvest he wants, isn't it? <coughs> now look at verse number seven. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. So he's talking about giving. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed the broad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Verse 10, now he that ministers seed to the soul, both minister bread from your food and multiply your seed so, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So God is talking about money being a seed. And he's saying if we sow that seed, and if we sow it bountifully, what kind of harvest are we going to get? We're going to get a bountiful harvest. If we sow it sparingly, what kind of harvest are we going to get? But he also notices that he says something. He says that he multiplies the seed so. So God has a financial system in place to finance the gospel. When I give my finances into God's kingdom or God's work, he said, I'm going to take that seed and I'm going to multiply it and he's going to bless me financially. Why would God bless me financially? Because I'm a giver. Why would God bless a giver? Because the giver is going to take his blessings and put it into the kingdom of God. And so God has a financial system. When we take tithes and offerings, that's God's financial system. He's been taking money in, and he's increasing that and multiplying that seed and blessing the givers because he knows if he blesses the givers, they're going to get back into the kingdom of God. God is not trying to, to prosper us and bless us so we can live like rock stars. He's going to bless the giver because he knows the giver is going to in turn give back to the kingdom of God and the works of God. He has a financial system of blessing the person who gives. That's God's system. Now the world system is just the opposite. The world system is based on financially taking money from you. That's what the government wants to do, don't they? All the time. I mean, that, that's what everybody's out to do is get your money. But God wants to bless the giver. And, and that seems simple. But a lot of people have a hard time with that. Because a lot of people think, well, if they're taking up an offering or something, and they talk about giving to God, what they're really doing is trying to take my money and give my money. But it's actually, that's God's financial system. That's why he says when we bring forth the tithes and offerings, he opens up the windows of heaven and pours out blessings we can't contain and rebukes the vow on our behalf. Why? Because he's pouring blessings into our life so that we can turn around and give to the kingdom of God. You're not, you know, I remember hearing those stories about Elvis. You know, Elvis was his cat ride would run out of gas and he'd buy another one. You know, well, that's true or not. You've heard those stories. But God's not interested in making us live a life like that. But God wants to set up a system where we give, he blesses us. We give more, he blesses us more. And bring money into the kingdom of God so that when we, so the kingdom of God, the, the ministry can look and see the man laying on the side of the road and think, boy, he, he needs help. Let's pick him up and take him to the end and pay for it and make sure he gets help. Y'all wouldn't have any fun when I got money. That's God's system. We give. That's why we find that time and time again in the scripture. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 6. <laughs> That's why God has that system in place. Verse 38. And there was a time in my life when I was first saved and young Lord, I had a hard time understanding all of this. Because I began to look at it, you know, it makes perfectly good sense. God has a system to finance the gospel. That hasn't changed. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all this shall be measured to you again. So again, give, and it will be given unto you. So if you're a giver, you're a receiver. So you can give again. And you give more, you receive more. You give more, you receive more. 
I know people in my life. There was one particular individual I knew in my life, and and, and I knew this individual years ago. And I tell you, that was a, one of the quickest people I've ever seen to give. I mean, he without hesitation. If somebody had a need, he'd give. You know, if ministry had a need, he'd give. Quick to give. I mean, he wrote some big checks. I'm not saying the amount was the thing, but he 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 got to the place to where he could give it because he was a giver. And I used to amaze me because me and that gentleman would do the same things in life sometimes. And, you know, whatever he did to have the good money, it just got blessed. I mean, I don't care what he did. I mean, if he started a business, it got blessed. And anything he did, it got blessed. And he really, and I was a very young in the Lord, and I didn't really understand that at the time. But now I make the connection. It's obvious he was a giver. I mean, he gave abundantly to the works of the Lord. Or if somebody, he owned a business, now, you know, if, a, if a, one of his employees came in and, you know, said, man, you know, I'm in trouble financially. I can't pay my rent it's here. Take this. He's quick to give. He didn't even think about it. He didn't even hesitate. It was just his nature to be a giver, I guess. And we've probably all known some people like that who are quick to give to the works of God. And one of the reasons is they understand this. Praise ye the Lord. Gotta give a shout, won't it? Luke chapter 9. So that plan has to change. Amen? Luke chapter 9. Verse number 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together, we're back to where we started, and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. It was kind of interesting. There was a time in my life when I had a tremendous conflict inside of me. Until I read this scripture. And I would just... You know, I had seen things in the body of Christ, and I'd been around ministries, and been involved with ministries that emphasized the power a whole lot. And I mean, they understood the power, but it didn't seem they had a clue about authority. And I was around people, it seems like they, they understood authority, they knew what they had in the name of Jesus, they were quick to take authority over something in the name of Jesus and deal with it. But it seems like both parties were kind of, you know, Separate. And it really created a conflict in me because I was wrestling in my own heart. Who was right here? And one right, the other one wrong. And, and one day, as a young believer, I opened that up and I began to read that scripture. And I see now where he gave power and authority. And I thought, bingo, now I understand. It takes power. We hear that speech, don't we? we got to have the power of God to cast out the devil. we got to have the power of God to heal the sick. This is their power and authority. Some on the other side of the corner say, you know what, we need to learn about the authority we have in the name of Jesus, and we do. But it takes power. That's why Jesus commissioned them and gave them power and authority. He didn't leave one out. It takes power and authority. You know, we look at the Lord of God, I mean, we look at the book of Acts. And so often we see how the church seemingly has fallen a long ways from there. I mean, you know, we, we see the great moves of God. We see the great outpourings of the Holy Spirit. We see the tremendous miracles. And, and we see those things to a degree in the time and the day and the hour we live. But not quite like we do in the book of Acts. And you have to say, how, how, what has happened? Why are we maybe in some ways less today than they were then? Well, there can only be one possibility. We have to be less in power and less in authority. And we can't be less in authority. We can be less in our understanding and the revelation of the authority that we have in Christ. You see, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1 8, you, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. To be witnesses and to be in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then we know the power came in the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. We know in Acts 
chapter 4, when the early church was challenged, they prayed and they cried out to God. And, and when they prayed and cried out to God, God poured out His Spirit again and just empowered them and shut the very building. And we, we find throughout the Scriptures that, that when people were up against challenges, they turned to God and got the Holy Spirit poured out upon them. And Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that we are to live, be filled with the Holy Spirit, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, be in a constant process of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to walk in the power of God. You and I, as believers, to be witnesses, need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have the same access to the power of the Holy Spirit that they had then. We have the same access to the power of the Holy Spirit that, that Peter did when he walked down the street. The people were being healed because the shadow touched it, because the anointing was applied so powerfully. We have the same access to the power of the Holy Spirit that they had. That has not changed. The commission hasn't changed. The plan hasn't changed. The provision hasn't changed. The power hasn't changed. The authority hasn't changed. You and I still have access to all of what God has laid out to enable us to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. Hallelujah. But you know what happens? Somewhere along the line in history, the church kind of took a shift and turned away from the power and tried to replace it with entertainment. Tried to replace it with education. Tried to replace it with psychology. Tried to replace it with, you know, numerous things. And grew content not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And grew content just having other church services and not walking in the power. You see, sometimes people think that you're talking about the power all the time. You're, you're kind of being selfish, but it's absolutely just the opposite. Because if we truly care about the lost and dying, we're going to be, be sure that we're walking in the power. Authority. You know, the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 23. The Apostle Paul was praying for the church in Ephesus. And it's referred to as one of the Ephesian prayers. And if you go back and read that, exactly what he was praying for them was that they would get a revelation of the authority that they had in Christ. And the revelation to, that they would understand what God did when he, when he raised Jesus from the dead. And what God did when he raised him up to ascend and to be on the right hand of the Father. And he said then he had been given all power and all authority. What God did when he commissioned the church to go forth into the world and preach in the name of Jesus and the authority that was in that name. You see, you know, we need a fresh revelation of the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. Peter and John were going to the temple one day to pray. There was a lame man there. They said, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. They understood the authority in the name of Jesus. They had the authority to use the name. They had the power of the Holy Spirit. And the man rose up and walked. You see, that's what the church has been commissioned to do. That's what you and I have been commissioned to do. To go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority and go to the lame and command them to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. To go to the demon possessed and command them to be set free in the name of Jesus. To talk by like Peter did with our shadow and the anointing going out and touching lives all around us. Beloved, we are called to do that, praise God. And not to go to church and just sit, sleep through the services. And say, what am I supposed to do? What's my purpose? Go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the name of Jesus, and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. Hallelujah. Why well, thought I was just supposed to watch TV and come to church on Sunday? I thought that was just for the preachers. I thought that was just for some evangelists. I thought that was just for some TV preachers. Oh, each and every one of us here had a commission to go into a lost and dying world in the power of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the name of Jesus, proclaim the gospel of Jesus.
Jesus Christ, lay hands on the sick and cast out devils. That gets them fired up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all, that, that should be good news. Pastor, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. I just told you. I just don't know my place. I just told you. Hallelujah. That plan has not changed. But sometimes we need our vision of the commission refresh. What do you mean we need our vision of the commission refresh? That sounds good, but what does it mean? Well, hopefully that's happening to you tonight. You know, one of the things that, that in God's word when we find with Abraham, and with Abraham, it was kind of almost seems God in time seems repetitive. I mean, in Genesis chapter 12, we know that God appeared to Abraham and called him out from his, his homeland. And he told him to go forth and, you know, and, and he told him, he said, you know, Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. Well, that's quite a vision, isn't it? That because of me and because of my life and because of me believing God, I'm going to step out and all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. He was probably fired up, wasn't he? You know, it's funny about people, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. People get fired up. Christians get fired up. And then they get toned down. Churches get fired up. And then they get toned down. God will move and you'll just see some services. Boy, God's really moving and stirring people up and firing people up. Praise God. Everybody's on fire. Everybody loves God. Everybody just wants to do something for Jesus. And you see that everybody about three weeks from now in the services, everybody said, I'm going, ooh, what happened? What's up, place? They need their vision refreshed. That's why you have goofy guys like me stand up and do this. Genesis chapter 17, God appeared to Abraham again. It's Abraham. Look at the stars. Yeah? Your descendants are going to be like that. You're going to be the father of many nations. That vision is being ignited, renewed, refined. A little bit later, God appears to him again. This kind of says the same thing. Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. In other words, he kept that vision alive on the inside of Abraham. He kept that, that, that fire burning a little bit. And you see, beloved, something has happened over the years to the church where that fire went out. And we've forgotten, apparently, the power of the Holy Spirit that is at our access as we go forth and proclaim the gospel. We forgot the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. And maybe we need a fresh revelation, a fresh stirring, a fresh vision of the, what we can be in the body of Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! That's enough to wake up with a robot. <laughs> Where do you stand with this vision? Where do you stand with this commission? That's for all of us. That's for me. That's for each and every one of us here. Where do we stand? Are we walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we walking in the authority of the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. Are we awake? Yes. Has to start there. But where do we stand? 
Church says, hey, Lord, praise God, we need revival. What are we saying? We need stirred up upon our condition. We need that fire to lit again. Maybe someday that fire a long time ago was lit up and we realized in the power of the Holy Spirit we can do mighty things for the kingdom of God. We realize in the authority that we have in the name of Jesus we can do great things for the kingdom of God. And maybe that fire just went dim and went out. Maybe it's just low and maybe it's never been there. Maybe we've never really had that vision in our life that God could use us to do such works as that. Maybe we just kind of went to the motion and just went to church and just went to the services and, and, and never really had a fresh vision ignited on the inside of us. And wait a second, what they did in the Bible, I can do. I can do what God told them that 70 to do. I can do what God commissioned the church to do. I can do all the things because not because of who I am, but I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. I can do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. I can do it in the authority of the name of Jesus. I can go forth and do mighty things because God has sent me and commissioned me and empowered me and authorized me to do it. Amen. And not just who I am and what my abilities are, my strengths are, my intelligence are, and my resources. But because of what He has given as our provision. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is alive. 